Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Telescope Talk Pro. We've got another hangout plan this week. It's it's Thursday at 3 o'clock. Must be time for a hangout. So my name is Tony Darnell. I'm from deepastronomy.space, but you guys know that already. And today we are going to be talking about something that I'm really excited about. I have been talking for a long time on this channel about sooner or later, you and I, are going to start are going to be able to get involved in exoplanet research. I mean, I I I've thought that from the beginning because as you've heard me talk about, when I first started in astronomy, I worked at the High Altitude Observatory and I worked at with a with a man named Tim Brown. And he had a what looked to me like an amateur setup outside in the parking lot at HAO where he was looking, was using a project called STAR, S-T-A-R, and it just looked like a bunch of amateur equipment. He was measuring some of the first exoplanet transit light curves ever. And it, of course, it was an F2 telescope, really big, um, uh, really short focal length, wide field of view telescope. But, I got, but that it was my introduction into exoplanet science. Now, this was like the late 90s, early 2000s. And of course, since then, Kepler's been launched and and we know more about exoplanets than we ever could have thought. So things have really exploded. But I've always gone back to this idea that you and me should be able to do this science sooner or later. And my guests today have uh, started a project. From, it's called Panoptes, Project Panoptes. And they are going to tell us all about this is a citizen science initiatives that will um, uh, we can get involved in. So let me go ahead and bring them up here now. Um, hi, guys. Welcome to our little hangout here. Hello. <laughs> now, I, I've, you're both in the same frame. So on the right part of that, oh, was, yeah, the right part of that frame is Dr. Josh Wallowender. He is uh, you're from Keck. Is that right, Josh? That's right. I'm a staff astronomer at Keck Observatory. At Keck Observatory, and and on and on the left side of the frame is Dr. Olivier Guyon. He, I believe, that you're at Subaru. Am I right? That's right. I'm uh, work at this Subaru telescope. And this is on Mauna Kea. Correct. Yes. So you guys are you're joining from Hawaii, as if Josh's shirt didn't give us that hint okay <laughs> so it's early in the morning for you guys and i appreciate you guys joining uh one of the reasons we do these hangouts at three o'clock eastern time is it is it uh, i i can still get people in hawaii where it's like 9 a.m your time but i can but right now we've got people in europe watching where it's evening so we're spanning half the globe at least uh today with these hangouts so all right so who wants to start i uh, tell us a little bit about the project that you guys have started, um, and I'll let you decide who, which one does it. Okay. Well, you started the project, so why don't you open up? Yeah, okay. So, well, it's, it's uh, you know, both Josh and I are professional astronomers, but but we have a background in amateur astronomy. So we've actually been uh, uh, really enjoying observing the sky with small telescopes. And, uh, you know, those two met together with Panoptes, essentially the, the professional and amateur side. We... Uh, we found out we both like to take astrophotography. We found out that uh, commercial cameras are actually getting good enough that you can see transits from exoplanets. So transit is the is essentially the easiest way to find an exoplanet is to patiently wait for it to pass in front of a star. And then when it does so, the star becomes a little dimmer. And uh, we figured out that we could measure that with uh, small cameras and telephoto lenses. And that's how the project uh, started. So. Now we're uh, bringing this um, to the public uh, and essentially uh, helping uh, folks, schools, amateur astronomers build those uh, units uh, and, and putting the data together with our partners so we can find exoplanets. Now, have you, I, let me, I guess I should start by putting up the website. If you guys want to follow along, let me, let me put this up here so you guys can see it. Um, this is their this is their website. You go to projectpanoptes.org and uh, you could you could find out about what they're doing and some of the things that and how you can get involved. Now, so you've started this. How old is the project, guys? And I've got I've still got the web page up. Um, well, if we go back to the really first. Um the first step, I guess, was uh, something I, I built in my garage and Josh and I deployed in, uh, in late 2009. Um, and this was the very first prototype. Um, um, and so that's really when it started. We've, we've gone through lots of uh, iterations since then. We've made things uh, 
much better, easier to build, more reliable, a uh, lot of activity, a lot of work on the software as well. Yeah, I mean, so this really started with Olivier playing with nighttime time-lapse photography. And, you know, it sort of became a question of, gee, these images are really good. I wonder if you could do something scientifically with this. And that was sort of the genesis of this idea to, to you know, create something that you could do real science with and yet was relatively low cost because we're talking about DSLRs. They're not $10,000 scientific CCDs. They're, you know, accessible. They're commercial grade stuff. Um, and so the question really came up, gee, you know, can we do something interesting scientifically with this? And that's where the project got its start. So you have, you've put together a, a, a list of equipment on your website and we'll get into a little bit more detail later, but what are the two most important parts of equipment that's needed now for exoplanet research? You said that these are basically DSLRs. They're not telescopes. So does that mean that they are wide field of view, very wide field uh, lenses? Because I remember, as I said at the top of this hangout, when I saw what Tim Brown had done, he had an F2 uh, optical system, real wide field, okay? So is that a requirement for this work? You've got to have something that sees a lot of stars at once? Yeah, so what we've designed really comes out of the idea that, you know, DSLRs are an incredible value in terms of high quality pixels per dollar, right? You get 20-ish megapixels for a few hundred bucks for a, a you know, low-end commercial DSLR. And when you couple that with a fast, you know, camera lens off the shelf, wide field, you can see tens of thousands of stars in a single image. And so you could, if you could measure the brightness of all of those tens of thousands of stars at once, then you can actually search, you know, tens of thousands of stars all at once for planets if you just stare at that patch of sky. And so what we've done is we've basically designed a completely autonomous observatory that uses as much off the shelf parts as possible. So our telescope is just a, a you know, commercial camera lens, 85 millimeter focal length camera lens. Uh, it's an F1.4. Um, we, our baseline unit, there's some varieties out there, but our baseline unit uses uh, Canon Rebel DSLRs. So again, trying to keep costs down, you know, go with the, you know, low end equipment, so to speak. Um, and then a, a small commercial telescope mount to steer it. And uh, we, our project has written software to operate the observatory in an autonomous manner so that it will just, pick up when the weather's good and start observing and take the data needed to hunt for exoplanets. So do these, uh, these uh, cameras, the hardware that you're asking people to put together, uh, are they connected to the internet or can they send data to you like with, on an SD card or something? So the, the, the standard way this works is basically the, at night, the cameras take pictures and ideally um, the, the unit that, that people build is connected to the internet. Um, and and uh, we're partnering with Google on this project. So the picture basi uh, basically are transmitted to the Google Cloud, uh, where there is uh, software that essentially puts them together with other pictures taken by other units to, um, to draw light curves of, of stars and, and look for uh, transit events. Okay. So uh, it sounds to me like and I, I, de I definitely want to talk about this a little bit more detail in a minute, but it sounds to me like the real breakthrough here that allows people to do this work is going to be in the software um, that you guys have are running on your end because DSLRs, these Rebel DSLRs, what did you say? 85 millimeter F1.4 lenses. Those have been around for a long time. So it's not that it's been this ability to take these wide field images and, and process them. Right. That seems to be the real breakthrough here yeah one of the challenges you know i said earlier that the dslrs are this incredible value in you know pixels per dollar but there's an enormous challenge associated with them in that you have this bare color filter array overlaying the sensor and so the tr trouble is is that when you have a wide field camera stars the images of a star are very very small they're a pixel or, or a few pixels across so if that star if the center of it lands on a red pixel the star is going to look reddish if it lands on a blue pixel it's going to look bluish etc and so the challenge has always been getting good photometry the brightness measurement out of these cameras 
And it was actually the first big hurdle in the project was to do that. Because if you just do traditional aperture photometry the way astronomers, you know, learned it in, in school, um, you get not very good results. You see a lot of scatter in the brightness of the stars because, you know, tiny motions or tracking errors move the star around on that color pixel array. The amount of light that falls into any one particular color changes dramatically. And so Olivier uh, early on actually developed an algorithm that does this very careful comparison of the star with all the other stars in the field of view and essentially takes out this effect. And it allows us to actually get uh, 1% level photometry out of individual exposures with this if they're taken in a nice long sequence where you can monitor how stars move across this color filter array. Okay, I love how you just said that. Uh, you know, we you, you talked about a problem that is actually quite big, and then you go, and then Olivier wrote that this removed that effect, and now we can do all of this stuff. I have a feeling that that was a lot harder uh, than it sounds because I've heard about these Bayer overlays, essentially with with commercial grade CCDs, or these are CMOS actually, I think uh, that that there is a layer of lenses on top of the detector that give you color. That's why you want color images from your DSLR and these are various you would you call them a Bayer a Bayer matrix right yes. and, and and so there's RGB or maybe some other kind of color I'm not sure what over each pixel or maybe each each group of pixels has a filter over it but they're read out as one whatever it is uh, there these are optical elements that will get in the way of your photometry and in the end that's what we want we are we want to be able, you want to be able to detect a dip in brightness that is so tiny that you're going to have, it might even be, it'll be, well, it'll be hard to tell from noise, won't it? I mean, this is like, give us a sense of just how small this dip in brightness is. We're basically looking at dips that are 1% or smaller. 1%. So if you've got a star... I'm going to just pick Trappist 1 because everybody loves that one. Uh, it's so bright compared to all the other planets around it that you're looking at a 1% dip in brightness or maybe even something more complicated if, if two or more planets are moving in front of that star at the same time. And you found a way. So it's bad enough if you just had a CCD with nothing in the way. But with these DSLR cameras, they've got this layer of optics on them that you really don't want. So... Can you describe in a way that we would understand? And if you can't, that's fine. I, I understand this may be putting you on the spot, but how did you overcome that? How was it? Well, was it a calibration? Could you calibrate those out somehow? Like we were flat? actually using to our advantage the fact that there are many stars in the image, and we're not trying to figure out the detail of how is the image formed, how does the light interact with this matrix of filters and lenses. The only thing we're doing is we're looking. If we, if we want to reconstruct the photometry, the light curve of a star, we're looking for other stars in the image what, that have the same behavior, where the light seems to behave the same way between the pixels. So we do a search in the image. We search among tens of thousands of stars. And we look for stars that, you know, the image essentially looks the same frame to frame, the same as our science target. Let's say we have a science target. That's the one we're trying to measure the brightness of and we have 50,000 other stars. We're gonna look, the first step is we're gonna look among those 50,000 other stars, which one behaves the same way as our target? Which one has the same frame to frame sort of pixel, distribu pixel value distribution? So essentially we're, we're using to our advantage the fact that there's lots of stars and we're trying to find the ones where all of these effects have played out the same way without even trying to understand what those effects are. We just look, we compare the images of the stars to each other to find what, the ones that match you know, the, the, the target we're trying to, to re reconstruct the photometry from. And then once we've found those best matches, we just say, well, those are going to be our reference. Uh, and from now on, the only thing we're gonna try is compare the brightness of our target with the brightness of those references. So because you've got so many stars in a frame, you're using that ability to, you're looking at all the stars there without assuming that there's a planet there. You're just looking for yeah. homo homogeneous effects of some kind among all of these different stars 
to kind of characterize that particular CCD. And then once you've determined what those characteristics are, then you can somehow get rid of those, not look at them, and only pay attention to the the change in the signal that you want to see in the star in the target star. I mean, I, right. I may have screwed that up, but I'm, I'm trying to get this in my head myself. Because you've got so many stars in the frame, you can look at what they're doing on a CCD frame and compare that with what you want to know and remove those and kind of characterize a little bit the CCD itself, right? Or the detector. So here's an example. Imagine there's a star and it's landing, you know, the, the detector is divided up into red, green, and blue pixels. And they're in groups of four, red, green, green, blue. And imagine there's a star that is landing, you know, somewhere in that area and it looks predominantly green. Say you've got a little bit of tracking error and the star is slowly moving across that grid. At some point, it's going to transition from predominantly green to predominantly blue. And you have to look at this over a sequence of images. Well, if you look at all those 50,000 stars, there are other stars that are going to ha have started in the same position and transition across that red, green, green, blue pattern at the same time. You find those, you pull them out, and you say, amongst this population of stars, they should have this same variation in brightness due to all the camera effects. Any difference that remains is an actual change in the brightness of the star. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, that's impressive. Okay, <laughs> as someone who, who has calibrated data before, I, that's an impressive uh, approach. So uh, let's talk a little bit now about the... the uh, the hardware itself. I want to go, I'm going to go bring up the, um, do you hear my dog? He's, he's actually asleep behind me and he's barking in his sleep. <laughs> yeah. I think he likes our algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's totally dreaming right now. It's really cute. Although he's not a very cute dog. He can be quite scary. Okay. So I've got the web page up and, um, here, let me uh, get my cursor back. There we are. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna click on the um, get building um, button on your website where it's where you talk about the uh, the things that you're asking people to build. Now you're not supplying equipment, right? Let's be clear on that. That's right. You're asking people who want to get involved to build their own. That's absolutely right. We uh, we're not supplying anything. But we basically maintain and 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 uh, and support instructions. How do you build this? And um, we uh, we also supply all of the software you need to run all of this. Okay, so the software is free, and you there, you've broken the instructions down into several sections. There's the mechanical stuff you got to do, the electronic stuff you got to do, then the computer, and then the deployment. Let's let me just look at. Um, so you, these are these. When you say that the website says that you don't need to do any machining, but when I click on the the camera box fabrication thing, and I'm showing that now, that looks like you got to do some machining. <laughs> um, so the way it was designed, you know, we work at you know observatories, so we have access to machine shops and and engineers, and so you know we could have built this in a very very different way that took advantage of the tools that were accessible to us. But what we tried to do here is assume that you only have typical, you know, home garage tools. So no, no mills, no lathes, no CNC, anything. And so all the parts are purchased. We try and buy things that are already sized correctly and that, you know, all the holes, you basically just go in with a hand drill. Um, now, if you do have a machine shop, it's going to make life easier. Um, but it's all designed you know, with the idea that you're going to be able to go to your local hardware store and get the tools that you need. There's nothing uh, too sophisticated here. Okay. And, and stepping back a second, um, we should say that the whole idea behind Panoptes is not to have a big centrally driven science project where we're managing lots of sites and, and lots of equipment. It's to sort of invite people in to try and build a community that is is working together to do science so you know we've designed this thing and we're putting it out there and you know trying to encourage 
uh, amateur astronomers, but also school groups, because we think it'd be a great school project, either for a, an after school club. There's here in Hawaii, we have a lot of uh, the schools doing robotics clubs. We think this, this sort of fits in with a lot of the skills that they'll have. And to do that and then actually contribute towards science with, um, you know, with the, the build and operation of this, you know, little robotic observatory. This is so great. So as you're talking, I'm scrolling through this document, which, by the way, it's funny as I'm as I'm showing it. I, I notice it's a Google Drive doc, and all these people start showing up, so they're they're looking at it too. Um, the, uh, the 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 camera mounting plates, all of this stuff appears to be pretty simple, like you said. It's just it's just holes, except for the dovetail, which I assume goes on to the mount but you that's that's an off the shelf i think you said it's an ioptron uh dovetail right uh dovetail clip yeah. rail so it's uh, an ioptron mount um and you know amateur astronomers will be familiar with most of the yeah mounts yeah. and dovetails and things like that they'll recognize all that stuff so the idea is to build a box that'll hold two dslrs and their lenses in a way that the mount can track. And that's really all it is, right? If you can find, do you need to use this stuff? Like if I had to, do I have to use the ioptron mount? So there's some flexibility built in. Our software is designed around what we're calling the baseline unit, the baseline design, which uses Canon and ioptron, for example. Yeah. Um, other people have already come in and added support for other mounts to our software. Um, and I don't remember if we've, we've definitely got things like SBIG cameras and folks, people have played with adding that support. So, you know, we're encouraging people to do the baseline, but it is certainly designed with the idea that people can come in with different equipment. Well, um, yeah, I mean, that, that could be a problem, couldn't it? If they don't use these, uh, these Bayer Matrix CCDs, then will your software still work? Like SBIG, SBIG is a CCD, it, Donna uh, Seamus. It will. It, um, it, it will work. Uh, if you use a CCD, it won't have to work as much. It, you know, it. It still does this characterizing you're talking about, yeah. though. This, this. Uh, you know, we should mention that all of the software is also completely open source, and uh, it's collaboratively uh, developed software. Okay. Um, so, you know, we we welcome uh, help also and, and and engagement from from software uh, people who are familiar with software to actually grow the project in uh, directions that they uh, they might want to grow it. Uh, so support for other cameras, other mounts, that's a great example of, uh, of, of you know, people can jump in and actually... Uh-oh, uh, uh did you go away? Uh, uh, our, 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 our really uh, highlighting here is that we need to be able to have instructions that some someone who, who is not experienced can follow step by step. So we have set up a, a baseline configuration uh, that people can follow without being experts in software development, without being even expert in amateur astronomy. And we're really targeting high school level uh, kids for that. And right. then depending on the level of experience, especially amateur astronomers, they can do a lot more than just blindly follow the instructions. They can actually contribute to the project in more uh, significant ways in terms of hardware development and software development. Okay. All right. Well, let me, let me, uh, I'm, I'm sitting here clicking buttons. Let me just stop doing that. And um, I want to look on the telescope here. Let's see what that looks like. What do you, what are you recommend, recommending for a baseline unit for the pier? Um, so it looks like you've got just some pieces of aluminum concrete anchors, aluminum extrusions, and this is to build the pier itself if you wanted yeah. to. Okay. Now, um, where do I see the, where do I find the, the stuff on the cameras themselves? Where do I, do you, do you just, you just recommend a, a, any, any uh, Canon Rebel SDSLR and ioptron mount? Yeah, so our baseline uses an Ioptron IEQ30. And one of the things we should point out, um, one of the ways, you know, one of our big goals, keep the cost down, make this accessible. And one of the ways we do that is we don't have any sort of enclosure. There's no roll-off roof. There's no dome around this. And so one of the reasons that the cameras are in a box is to protect them from the weather. And part of the instructions you'll find is how to weatherproof the mount. Yeah, so the yeah, I saw that. The mount in a particular uh, orientation, and then you, you know, using some either plastic or, or sheet aluminum. We've had people do this in a couple of different ways. You can basically create a cover 
that still allows the mount to pick up and, and move around the sky, but that when you point in this one particular direction facing down, uh, it'll be protected from the weather. And that was actually one of the big challenges and one of the big um, successes early on of showing that this, this can work, this can survive. Um, our, our prototype is up on one of the local mountains here. It survived snowstorms, 100 mile an hour winds, rain, now, when I saw the one at your booth, and I'm looking at this picture here, the one that I'm, I'm in uh, Mount Weatherproofing uh, Installation Instructions, and it looks like you've got the cameras enclosed in some kind of just standard off-the-shelf box. Yes, that's right. So we just use a standard uh, weatherproof enclosure, NEMA rated, um, you know, Again, we're trying to be all off the shelf wherever possible. Okay, and the, and the mount, the, this equatorial mount is Ioptron? That's the Ioptron mount? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. So if I wanted to do this and I do, <laughs> and I am also an amateur astronomer and I know how to build and program things. So I am a great candidate for all of this. And I have five acres of land and I have internet connections. Um, how much would I be, what I have to spend to become involved in this? If I wanted to build everything as you imagine the normal participant to 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 spend so the, the total cost for the for the baseline unit is five thousand dollars in hardware so you basically need to, need to spend five thousand dollars in various parts that are uh, off the shelf and that you can uh, you can buy online and oh, it, which is about the size of a high quality you know um prosumer grade <laughs> amateur stuff i mean if you were to get a a Takahashi or a mount, uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, higher end Explore Scientific mounts, whatever it is, you'd be spending around 5K, especially if you've got a 104 millimeter, uh, you know, APO uh, refractor. So you, that's about what you'd expect to spend on a really high end piece of equipment. Once I've got yeah. this set up and I am ready for observations, do I need to coordinate? Do you guys coordinate the stations? Or do I just start taking images and send them to you? How does it work? What what do I do uh, to participate in this to get my observations used in your research? So the the software that is provided, which runs on the little computer, that's one of the items you have to buy or use one you've already got if you want. Just just any um, just a computer to run software. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I mean, we use a sort of generic Intel based computer, nothing too fancy. Um, and it has uh, all the control software on there. So it checks the weather station that's part of the system. If it's safe, it'll start observing. And one of the things we distribute, and this is something we'll probably tweak, is a list of targets. And if you know, you're not actively using the system in some other way, it'll just look at that list, go through a little bit of a calculation to decide what's up and what's the highest priority of the things that's available to me. And it will just start observing it. And, um, you know, people can go and use this to take pretty pictures if they want. And then if they're not actively doing anything and the software is running, it'll just pick up and start observing. And when it's done, upload the data to the cloud. All right. So it is fully robotic. It has a weather station. Uh, it has a software on the computer that, that reads the weather uh, conditions, uh, talks to the network, knows what are the highest, highest priority fields, and it will take decision on it on its own all night long. So you do not need to actually uh, even interact with it if you don't have the time. Uh, but that's just my chance. If you actually want to take a, a, an image, if you have some project, for example, you want to run either by yourself or with other people from the network, uh, you can, by all means, drive the unit to do that project. Okay. And uh, so as I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about the possibilities, and when you said computer, one of the things I wanted to know almost immediately, because I'm trying to figure out a really good project to use one of these, is can you use a Raspberry Pi as a computer? I'm dying to figure out something to use one of these for, because I have one. I paid like $35 for it, and I'm trying to figure out what a good use for it is. But I understand that those are Linux sort of operating system kind of computers. Do Are you dependent on any kind of operating system to run your software? Um, so our computer, we used a, an Intel-based computer, so it's a little different. But so we actually no use pies. a Linux 
operating system on it because again, we want to keep costs down. So we didn't want commercial software to run this. Yeah. Because you know, if you're familiar with astrophotography, you can spend a significant amount of money just on the software. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And so our computer is Linux based. Our software is Linux based. We uh, are looking at Raspberry Pis. We think there's a lot of uh, possibilities there. We haven't actually done this and tested it. But what would be ideal is if somebody like yourself or, or somebody else who's interested comes and says, hey, I want to play around with this Raspberry Pi. Let me try and install it and plug it into my system and see what works, see what doesn't work, and just sort of work with us on it. Because we're, we're super excited about it. Um, it brings the cost down. Anything we can do to drive costs down and make it more accessible to more people um, is something we're interested in. And Raspberry Pi is one of the ways. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I the more I... I, after I bought one of those and I got the little touch screen and everything, I was like, boy, this is cool. Now I don't know what to do with it. Uh, but I'm trying to figure out a way with them. And I, and I know that there are people who have built, for example, around the revolution imager, they built little eyepiece imagers that run on a, a raspberry Pi. Uh, but that's very, um, different use case than what you guys are doing. And I think this might be a good, this certainly interests me. So I maybe I'd like to look into that. Let me bit. pick up on something you mentioned also, which is, you know, running your own project. Um, and, and let me play out an example, uh, you know, for example, a, a bright comet shows up uh, and it's, it's very big, nice big tail. You know, you may actually, uh, being a Panoptest user or even being a random person who's interested in taking a video of that comet, you can go on, we have a forum where uh, Panoptest members can discuss and you could basically post, hey, this comet showed up. I think a bunch of us should take pictures of it. Um, and you, you would basically uh, enroll uh, multiple units to take pictures of the comet. And because we're a global international project, you could take continuous picture of the comet because you would have sort of 24 hour coverage. And then uh, you, know, you could have a group of people basically assemble a nice, uh, a nice video, which would be aesthetically very, very nice, but also uh, could have some scientific uh, application. So that's an example of the flexibility. You know, once you have build these units and, and there's a network of, of an international network of these units, uh, such things become quite easy to, uh, to do. How, how old is the project and how many people do you have participating now? So the project, you know, like I said, this started back in sort of 2009, 2010, but at that point it was just sort of playing around on weekends. Uh -huh. And, um, so at some point, what about three years ago, I think, we actually got a uh, grant from uh, NASA's Universe of Learning program to help us uh, with this project and to, you know, sort of, you know, encourage the, the project to, to build out. And so right now, you know, Olivier and I, we have our day jobs working at observatories, but this is how we choose to spend some of our, our personal research time and just our, our sort of weekend time. Um, we've got one grad student who's working on the project, mm -hmm. uh, who's been doing most of our software. He's been fantastic. Everything that's part of the, the control system for the <laughs> observatories he's written. And then we've got something like a dozen builders right now. We've got three or four units that have contributed data into the network and something like a dozen that are in various stages of, of the build process. Yeah, because I gotta say the 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 um, barrier to entry seems high. I mean, you gotta really want to uh, you gotta really be a tinkerer first of all, not be afraid to just uh, you know buy two. It's more than just buying two DSLRs and hoping for the best. You gotta you gotta build some stuff and then plug them in and and do things that a lot of people may not be that comfortable with. So at first, you'll probably get a lot of. Uh, hobbyist types like me who like to build things aren't afraid to to open the backs of of electronics units up and things like that um but it's i, I i'm happy to hear that you're you're starting to grow on this but can you tell us a little bit about now the the science use case because we know because we have hangouts but we've talked about exoplanets a lot on this channel we know about Space telescopes like Kepler, Tess is up there right now looking at the entire sky for a couple of months per sector, and it's measuring these transits. Uh, we know the difference between a, uh, a candidate and a confirmed exoplanet. 
and the role that everything plays. I mean, we know that space telescopes tend to provide candidates, <laughs> which are then followed up by ground-based observatories like yours, Subaru and, and Keck, where they are then confirmed uh, exoplanets using either radio velocity or more transits, right? So is the intended science case for the, Pan the Project Panoptes, is it? to confirm exoplanets that we know about? Is it to build up a bigger repository of longer term light curves? Because we are, we are pretty biased towards short period planets. Uh, or is it to discover a new exoplanets? What do you hope to get from all these observations? So one of, definitely the strategic advantage of the Panoptes Network is going to be uh, time coverage, uh, yeah. nearly continuous time coverage. So we're aiming at providing essentially nearly continuous time coverage over most of the sky, which is very complementary to other uh, facilities such as TESS. So yes. TESS is a great example because TESS will find lots of um, maybe single transit candidates or maybe two and, transit. And real short period ones too. <laughs> and, uh, so it will do, TESS will, will, will do its best on the short period ones because it'll find, it'll see multiple transits and will be able to match the period. But it will also find a lot of maybe only one transit. Uh, and then this is where we come in, having the time coverage, the space and time coverage. We can follow... Uh, basically, the, 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 the Panoptes community can follow a lot of this and identify a large number of, of, of test candidates as bonified exoplanets. I couldn't agree more that this is, I mean, this is exciting to me because I think that this is the one big gap we've, we're facing because obviously space telescopes can't look everywhere all at once. They've got limited time. Hubble, you've got is no. It's not even a survey telescope. It's got to know where to look. It's not going to be doing many exoplanet discoveries. It might do some follow-up observations to fill in some light curves. But the big gap here are long period, long coverage over a huge amount of time uh, of, of these light curves because we even ground-based telescopes, as wonderful as they are, and even their dedicated survey telescopes, they still have limited time. Uh, they can't just keep looking at Trappist-1 forever. They've got to go and go somewhere else. So uh, they have other people that want to use them for different things. So this is really, I think, hugely important uh, to fill in these long-term gaps. And who knows? You might actually find a planet who has a period of 300 years, you know, and you're just now starting to get a piece of the light curve. And that would be a discovery that somebody could make from this. So I think it's, I think it's hugely important. So that's really cool. Um, okay. So you've told us about how we can build it, uh, with modest amounts of money and how we get in the software is free. We connect to your, we connect to your system and then you're going to, um, uh, basically if we're not using it, it sounds like you're going to control it, right? Well, I mean, we control it in the sense that the system has its own set logic. You turn it on. It's kind of like SETI at home. If you're not using your computer, then then they'll use your computer cycles, right? So, so what are the typical exposure times that you're going to be taking uh, from these cameras? What? How long are we going to stare at the sky? It's about two minutes. Two minutes per exposure. Um, and essentially. For, for exoplanet transit, the best thing to do is to stay on, on the same part of the sky for as long as possible. Uh, so we typically, uh, if you look at the Panoptes unit working at night, it will slow uh, and it will track continuously for maybe two to three hours on the same piece of the sky, taking one picture every two minutes. Okay. Uh, and it's continuously exposing. So as soon as, a, as an exposure is, is over, the next one starts a few seconds later. Um, so the, the, the duty cycle is nearly 100%. We're always essentially catching photons. Um, and so typically the unit will look at maybe three fields in the night, uh, each of them for about three hours. And then you're from that build up these, these mosaics uh, from basically all over the world uh, where whoever is operating and, get, and build up these, uh, these databases. Yes, exactly. 
Man, this is exciting. Okay. Um, and we should mention that, uh, you know, it's, it's not really us driving the project. It's a community project. It's a citizen science project. And all of the data is all immediately public. So uh, anyone can have access to the data and do whatever they want with it uh, uh, immediately. And uh, that's something that our partner, uh, Google Cloud, is, is, uh, is very committed to supporting as well. Okay, great. Uh, well, I'm going to get to some questions here from the people who are watching. Um, Walter, or waiter, is that Walter or waiter? It's Walter G. <laughs> Sorry. Um, he goes, hey, Tony. Hey, Walter. Um, ask the guest if they ever thought of developing software for people that already have CCDs or CMOS mono cameras and astro rigs who are willing to take images with equipment they already have. That's that's really Great question, Walter. I was going there next. So, yeah, I've already spent. There's there's amateurs out there, you know, who have spent ten grand on. They have lost Mon, lost Mandy mounts. They've got you know, uh, hundred and twenty millimeter apos. You know, they've got some pretty nice equipment. Any way that they could use that equipment to bring to bear on this project. So, basically, for Panoptes itself, for the core mission, you know, a lot of the data analysis algorithm assumes something roughly similar to what we've got, you know, with the, the wide field of views that you have all the comparison stars. There are a couple of different ways that people who have equipment that doesn't really fit, you know, closely to that can participate. One is as Panoptes ramps up, we'll be publishing candidates. You know, as you mentioned before, we'll, we'll see things that look like transits, they need follow up. Um, and the other, so we'll need people to, you know, look at those um, with higher resolution and and with larger telescopes. But also, you know, in general, even for other projects like TESS, they're looking for the same sort of follow-up from people like that. So, you know, we have a very sort of targeted mission and, you know, it's always tempting to try and bring in as much as possible, but given, you know, our limited time, we're sort of focusing on this <laughs> <Still> core <freak. laughs> yeah. mission of doing the wide field searching, uh, with DSLRs or at least similar equipment like that. Yeah, there's a real advantage, isn't there, to have a to have a worldwide network of more or less homogenous equipment. I mean, so the, the question is a great question because we, we do get that a lot, and and we would love to be able to support um, other hard hardware setups. As as Josh mentioned, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge for us in terms of um, you know where we focus our energy. But I think eventually we 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 we'll, we we'll really want to support that. We are unfortunately, you know, not able to support that right now. But that's something that you know we hear a lot of folks with exactly the same question, and we do want to take, uh, you know, to to enable that uh, as soon as we can. Right. Okay. Um, and I just want to point out also, Walter, that next week and at, in the same weekend, I was at Neef and I met these guys. I also ran across a guy named Jerry Hubble. I know the the name is not lost on me, but no relation. Uh, but anyway, he has to, he works for Explore Scientific, and he has developed a way using just off the shelf apochromats uh, and diffusers. He uses a I think it's a half degree refuse, diffuser. I forget. I'll have to look it up. Anyway, he diffuses the light and measures uh, uh, light curves that way, and he was able to do it. We're going to meet with him next week to talk about the details of that. But that's slightly different than this, only because this is a, that it would be a one-off thing, something that you would just do because you could. But this is a coordinated effort for that scientists and astronomers will use. Um, uh, Paranor wants to know, you could use telescopes in the VLT type array. Um, oh, I think he's referring to, you know how on the VLT they've got uh, these unit telescopes and then they put them together uh an interferometry. Uh, I don't think that you could do that with this. Yeah. Could you? We actually get that question a lot too. So that's a good question. So you'll oh, notice okay. that the Panoptes baseline unit has two cameras in the head. And so we get a lot of questions about, do you do stereo vision? Or are you doing interferometry? And the answer is basically no. Um, so there are a lot of- No, what? You're doing stereo or interferometry? <laughs> What's the, what, the answer is no to what? No to both. Oh, um, okay. So, <laughs> There's a lot of subtle challenges to doing very, very accurate photometry. So things like scintillation, you know, the, the twinkling of stars, basically. Right, exactly. Uh, and one of the ways that we defeat that, that Panoptes has, is that we average together data from many, many units that are physically separated from one another. 
And so when we put two cameras in the in the head unit in the in a standard Panoptes unit, it basically doubles the amount of data we collect towards that averaging. And it the the additional increase in cost is only like 10 or 15 percent, you know, because you've bought the mount, you've bought the computer, you've bought all the weather proofing, you've bought the weather station. There's all this other, you know, infrastructure that goes into a completely autonomous observatory. So adding a second camera was the relatively minor increase in cost. Right. And so the power of Panoptes comes from this power of averaging. Lots of units working together, contributing their data to one place where, where averaging takes out all of these subtle local effects, um, gives us more accurate photometry. Yeah, and as you were describing that, it remi- it's it's a lot about, it re- reminds me a lot about what, this other guy with this amateur who developed a technique using diffusers uh, would do. I mean, in a way you're averaging these signals up in a diffuse way, sort of, and, you know, uh, adding them up and able to get the, the, the signal you want from this average of all the different detectors. So there, it's very similar in that way. It sounds like, okay, well, let's see. Um, Exoplanets Channel, he wants to know, does each unit cost around $5,000 or could the price be lower? Uh, what is the lowest possible cost that you think this can be done for? Because 5 k is a lot. The lowest possible cost, we're interested, as you mentioned before, the Raspberry Pi, which costs, you know, 35 bucks plus like an SD card. So you're spending 60 or 70 bucks on the computer. Um, you know, if we were able to sub out our computer that we use now, which is probably around four or $500 total, it's an Intel NUC, um, if you're familiar with those. Yes, yes. So those are the little boxes. Um, yeah. So you could save several hundred dollars that way. We're working towards that. Um, we've got a group that's actually playing with the idea of building your own weather station just with some electronics and some Arduino, which would drive that cost from, again, around five or $600 for the weather station down to $100 worth of parts and, and a little bit of time with a soldering iron. Um, and then if you come in, if you've got an old computer lying around, you know, that can sub in. We don't, it's not a highly demanding computational problem. So there's a lot of ways to carve the cost down a little bit, but it all depends a little bit on the, on the person who's doing it and what facilities they have. So our, our $5,000 budget is, I've got nothing but some basic tools in my garage. Got it. So yes, it's possible to get that a little bit cheaper uh, if you're able to build some of the stuff yourself. I mean, some of this stuff. I mean, uh, I mean, not to be pedantic, but the when you say you want a Canon Rebel, they also make a T3i and a T5i or something like that. Would well, do you care, or is it just got to be a Rebel? Um, we've used, I don't know how many different generations of Rebel. Um, okay. I think our current, <laughs> we were baselining on the SL1, which doesn't exist. Now there's the SL2. So, um, and in principle, you can throw other Canon cameras in there or even Nikons because the control system mostly doesn't care about the various ones. We're familiar with Canon because that's what we were using. Um, and if you want to spend money, big bucks on a, on a fancier Canon camera, you can yeah, and you can certainly spend extra money on those. I've learned that the hard way. Okay, well, good. <laughs> so the project is um, up and running now. You're getting people building, and you've, you're adding nodes as time goes on. Uh, you've got funding. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, did you say it was from the NSF or from – oh, NASA. It was from NASA – what was it again? The Universe of Learning Program. Thank you, the Universe of Learning Program. And uh, is there a – is there a life, a mission lifetime, or is this going to last as far as you can tell uh, into the future, or, are you, or is it going to be? Uh, is there a, you know, a, a, a time when you're going to have to stop doing this? Oh, sorry, we uh, had a little problem there. Oh, uh, uh, I, do, I was just asking about it, the length of the the length of time you're going to be able. You got some funding, uh, and you guys said said you're working on this also in your personal research time. Is there a time when you? Is there a projected? end date for this pro- program or will it just, is it open-ended? Not really. I mean, what, what I think of it as is that we're not, we're not running a project. We're building a community to do something cool. And if that community can exist beyond us, beyond our funding, um, you know, we just need to get that community built and then it will sort of self perpetuate. Right, so but you're going to need to put together you still need to be involved to put together the data, right? To build the light curves and to build the survey up. So I mean, we the community could still go on, but not if there's nowhere to send the data, right? 
Yeah. So, I mean, we've got a, a partnership with Google and, you know, on, on the scale of Google, we're not using anything of any significance to them. Um, so we have, you know, been given access to those resources and that would be the only real limitation okay. for longevity is just sure, maintaining sure. The, the cloud-based um, uh, data analysis system. I know this question, um, it doesn't have a definitive answer, but I mean, what do you, what, because it depends on how many people are taking data, but what is a typical, what do you expect your, um, survey data size to be your, your, how, how big, how much data do you expect to be able to? So each, each unit takes about three gigabytes every night. Uh huh. Okay. So that gives you a scale, you know, so. So three gigabytes uh, per, per pair of cameras per night per station. That's right. Okay. All right. Well, that's not so bad. You're right. That, in Google big. land, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's not very big. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And do you, and is there a way that, I mean, will there one day be a portal, uh, like a, like a data, um, data management portal where I could get access to the data or Absolutely. how is the data going to be made we're available? We're actually already beta testing one. So, um, <laughs> very soon we'll make it public. We, we are committed to make all the data public and easy to access and also, um, interactive you know, to, to deploy interactive tools for people to interact with the data. Good. Um, so check our website. I think pretty soon we'll put out a link to that uh, data. Uh, we call it the Panoptes Data Explorer, where you can see essentially last night's data um, from your computer from all of the units that are running. And who, which brings me to your uh, prospective customers. Who do you expect to be using this? Professional astronomers primarily or anybody interested in exoplanets? I think um, f definitely for the builders, we're focusing on um, amateur astronomers, uh, citizen scientists, um, high school and above. Um, okay. You know, school groups. Um, and so that's, that is our main audience. For, um, you know, we, we basically provide and support the data analysis um, so that those folks can, uh, don't, don't need to develop their own and can get the result of, of, of their hard work. Uh, so that's the way we, 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 we operate. In terms of who can contribute, uh, who will contribute in the, in the, ad, the scientific development, it, the, the project is, is completely open. So anyone who has time and skills to do that can do that. And so we envision that it will be a mix of, uh, of amateur astronomers, citizen scientists, and professional astronomers as well. And do you expect, um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking right now of, of, of things like Galaxy Zoo and others who have who have actually published papers based on the work that their citizen science community has done. Do you anticipate being able to do that as well? Having, having I don't mean, maybe not individual contributors. I don't know. It depends on what they do. But uh, do, you, do you anticipate, you know, have, writing papers based on this data and then crediting the, the community? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, exactly how that works is is still something we're, we're working on and designing. But one of the things we'd like to do, we haven't done this yet, is to have, um, you know, when we get to a point where the survey is really cranking along and we're actually producing exoplanet candidates and, and eventual discoveries, then, you know, we'll have a record of every single unit that contributed even one point of data toward that discovery. And we can, you know, show people what they've contributed toward. And, you know, that really is one of our dreams is to have a map that shows like, oh, for such and such a, a exoplanet that was discovered, here's a, a Earth, Earth view of all the stations that pitched in data towards that discovery. Here's the, the teams and the names of the people who are participating. I think that'd be so awesome. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that would just be great. Uh, I, I, I have been advocating for and wishing for something like this for a long time, knowing that it was coming. And I was so excited when I saw your booth at Neve. I was like, yes, I knew this would, would eventually happen. And uh, so I'm so glad you guys are doing what you're doing. And especially I want to thank you for taking time out to 
to talk with us about the Project Panoptes because I think, you know, there are people listening and watching and, and on, on my channels who I think will like to get involved. I'm particularly interested in getting a couple of cameras and seeing what I can do. So, uh, especially because I don't have a lot of time, but I love the idea of setting this up outside and then depending on the weather, just saying, all right, go and, and measure some exoplanets. So I am absolutely interested in building something like this uh, myself. So, uh, and I'll probably, I'll either stream it guys, or I will make videos showing you how I'm doing it and we can do it together. Right. And, and we can work through the problems together because I don't, I can machine if I want to, but I don't want to. So I'm going to take the simplest approach uh, that they advocate to build one of these. So I'm, that's how excited I am about what these guys are doing. And so stay tuned on this channel because I'll be probably making my own along and making videos as I go. So because this is... I don't, I don't, I know you guys, the, my guests, you know, I know Josh and, uh, Josh and Olivia, I know you guys know about the American association for variable star observers. It's old. It's been around forever, but for so long, it was one of the only ways it was the initial, the original, I think, uh, citizen science project around for decades. And what you had to do folks was you look through an eyepiece every night at some variable star and you wrote down how bright you thought it was on a magnitude scale. And they had some convoluted way of calibrating your eyeball. I remember this so that they could actually understand what that number was that you had written. I actually did that when I was in high school and I, I loved the fact that I was contributing, but now with all of the exoplanets that are out there in our galaxy, we're finally going to be able to get a better handle on how many there are, how, how far away they are from their stars and you know, all the things that the transit method can tell, can teach you about these systems. So this is the future, I think <laughs> of citizen science in a way that is unlike what even galaxy zoo is doing. Galaxy zoo managed to take surveys from, uh, you know, like Sloan or whatever it was, and they packaged it in a way that was digestible by the public and answer science questions from that data. Here you are doing discovery. You are building a survey. And um, I think it's, it's hugely important. So thank you both for taking time out to talk to us about this and, and best of luck. I hope uh, if you guys don't know about their project um, website, it is, let me pull it up real quick. I have to I have to get my, I should have had this queued up before I did it. Uh, where did my cursor go? There it is. It is um, projectpanoptes.org. There's a picture of the website right there. Please go to it, explore it, figure it out, and let's work together on building some, some instruments for ourselves and uh, getting involved in this project because I think it'll be exciting for everybody. So, uh, okay. So anyway, <laughs> I have it plastered over our face. That was very weird looking. <laughs> when you guys see the stream, you'll be like, why did he do that? Okay. So, um, all right. So thank you guys. And uh, I hope if, as things progress and as things change, you might consider coming back and, and talking to us again about this project. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us on. This has been a lot of fun and uh, yeah, we hope to hear from, from you and some of your guests and have them join the Panoptes community. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we look forward to seeing your unit at work. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's what, and so I, I'm, because I do this YouTube stuff, I'm probably going to, document the whole thing in video form and how I did it. So, uh, I, I'm going to give it a shot and, uh, and try to teach a lot of others how to do it and do it together. So, um, who knows how it works out, but anyway, okay, folks, well, I want to thank you all so much, uh, for taking time out, uh, for talking with us. Uh, thanks for another telescope talk hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. And I want to thank you so much for watching. And as always keep looking up. <laughs>